Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. So, so welcome to CSIS. Good afternoon, uh, assuming you're on the East Coast time zone. If you're not, good morning, good evening, um, good day. Uh, I'm Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President at CSIS, and I direct the economics program and delighted to welcome you to this program on uh, securing Asia's subsea network. Um, this is the latest in a series of explorations that we've been doing um, here on global infrastructure um, as part of our Reconnecting Asia project, which is part of my um, team at CSIS, but you may know it was run until recently by John Hillman, who uh, was director from the beginning, actually the Reconnecting Asia project five or six years ago. He left CSIS in late January uh, to go in to serve in government again, um, but he had been exploring uh, a, a range of different issues in the broadly defined digital infrastructure space and um, had um, uh, been exploring this area of subsea cables, which are really uh, important but li little understood uh, area, except among our experts, who I'm going to be introducing in a second. Um, we are um, marking the launch of a brief, a CSIS brief, uh, which is a short paper we did um, that was uh, posted today. You can find it on the CSIS website um, and uh, talks about sort of US strategic and commercial uh, interests in Asia's subsea cable networks. Um, and so I commend that to you. Happy to take your, your comments um, on, on the paper. Um, we're, we're interested always in your, your feedback and thoughts. Uh, but let me, um, let me first uh, start by thanking the sponsors of this project, Amazon, Google, Meta, and Microsoft, all significant owners of subsea cable capacity. Uh, we thank our sponsors always for making possible everything we do. Um, also want to thank the many experts who participated in three roundtables we held as uh, part of this uh, project. Um, and we're going to meet some of them today. I'll introduce them, as I say, in just a second. Um, uh, subsea cables uh, carry nearly all international data, including the data we're creating right now, um, underpinning global trade and communications. But uh, their importance, as I said, um, is far from sort of top of mind uh, for the general public. Uh, but very important issues. Um, they're important, um, obviously, as the pandemic has has accelerated digitalization of work, commerce, uh, education, um, medicine, um, and um, subsea cables. You know, power uh, U.S. digital exports, uh, generating new opportunities for small, medium-sized businesses um, and for large corporations alike um, as, to expand into new markets, especially in the dynamic and fast growing Asia Pacific region, where, you know, roughly half the world's population, half the world's GDP, half the world's trade, uh, takes place in the broadly defined Indo-Pacific Indo region. Um, and all of this is, is supportive of U.S. Uh, jobs and, and broader uh, national interests. Um, so in our brief, we examine how Asia's cable uh, network topography is changing um, and uh, which has significant implications for U.S. policymakers and businesses alike. Um, among other things, uh, China's rise as a builder and owner of cable systems has been rapid, heightening economic and strategic competition with the United States. Uh, new hubs, uh, such as Indonesia and the Philippines, are emerging uh, due to both their burgeoning digital ecosystems uh, and the need to increase uh, network resiliency. Uh, new Trans-Pacific routes, uh, are being developed that avoid landing um, in inc incumbent hubs like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore uh, or, or traversing um, uh, challenging areas like the South China Sea. And all of this presents uh, both opportunities as well as uh, challenges for, uh, for businesses and uh, for governments. And so uh, that's what we want to explore here uh, today. And we're going to look at how uh, policymakers and partners um, and businesses should uh, navigate uh, this evolving landscape, um, aligning commercial opportunities with, um, you know, with best security and governance uh, practices. So in the brief, um, you know, we highlight the critical role of the private sector in seizing those opportunities and in enhancing the resilience of subsea systems. Um, and we recommend, uh, so we have a, a number of top line recommendations about how the government can create the right 
enabling environment um, for uh, this business, um, among other things, by pursuing uh, subsea cable objectives in regional trade agreements, uh, by promoting cable best practices in emerging markets, um, by increasing the transparency and predictability of the cable licensing process and some other uh, ideas that we put, put forward. So uh, that's enough for me <laughs> with that. Uh, let me introduce our four uh, terrific experts today, all of whom have been great contributors to this project. And again, I, I thank you guys in particular for, for your uh, individual and collective contributions to this project. Um, so first, Tim Strong is Vice President of Research for Telegeography, um, where he works on network infrastructure, bandwidth demand modeling, uh, cross-border traffic flows, and telecom services pricing, among other things, I'm sure. Um, John Mellick is an international telecommunications specialist who has over 30 years of experience in starting, building, and managing growing technology companies uh, in international markets. Most recently, he was founder and chairman of the Djibouti Data Center. Um, Catherine Kreese is director of the U.S. Naval Seafloor Cable Protection Office. Uh, she has over two decades of experience in the subsea cable business, um, having also previously served in the Coast Guard and uh, having worked in the private sector. And finally, last but not least, Maureen Russell is Senior Policy Advisor in the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, which um, uh, this um, audience knows is part of the Department of Commerce, an important part uh, that advises the President on uh, telecommunications and information policy issues. And Maureen is central to that work, including as a member of what used to be called Team Telecom, the interagency uh, committee that's been restructured, renamed, um, that looks at uh, uh, telecom um, uh, licensing issues and, and uh, security related, uh, national security related concerns. Um, so I think that is um, the basic information about our, our four speakers. And I'm going to start with uh, asking a few of my own questions. Before I do that, let me just uh, tell the audience that you are welcome to ask your questions. I will try to take uh, at least a few of these at the end of our hour. Uh, we have one hour only, uh, now only uh, 53 minutes, I guess. Um, but I will try to take a few of your questions. You can submit your questions. There should be a button on your screen, and that will appear here. And, and we'll try to uh, take as many of those as, as we can. Uh, but let me start um, using my prerogative as moderator. Um, and I'm gonna start with Tim. Um, Tim, uh, to frame our discussion, can you provide sort of an overview? I mentioned the changing sort of topography, the geography, the economic dynamics of cable routes, particularly in this important region, the Asia Pacific region. And along the way, if you wanna tell us what telegeography does, that would be, that would be helpful. Sure, well, telegeography is a market research firm and we collect data from pretty much anyone who uses or buys capacity on submarine cables. So we, we um, collect a lot of information and compile it and, and try to present it. It just so happens that this week we're finishing our major annual refresh of data on uh, submarine cable capacity. So I have some new numbers to share with you um, about the topography uh, of, of Asia and, and really the global internet. Um, in terms of of hubs, who who is what countries are hubs? If that's of interest to you, uh, we get asked that a lot. What are going to be the new hubs in Asia if Hong Kong is kind of going away? The um, the frustrating answer to that is we don't really know yet. There's uh, it's too early to tell. There's there's a lot of experimentation going on right now. I think by uh, big users of submarine cable capacity building out data centers and in places that haven't previously seen them, the Philippines and Indonesia uh, come to mind. But I, I can share some data if, if that's helpful. You just step back in terms of how much capacity goes between regions of the world. Uh, right now, 82% of all region to region or continent to continent capacity connects through the United States. And that seems like a lot, it is a lot, but it's been eroding uh, slowly over time. In 2005, that number was 96%. So to a certain extent, uh, uh, Asia itself, Asian countries to communicate with each other, sometimes trombone through the United States, but we're seeing that less and less. The number one route connecting in any Asian country, it is not um, connecting an Asian to Asian country, it's connecting Japan to the United States. And that's been the number one route in Asia uh, for 
I think since the advent of fiber optic cables, uh, that route grew 36% last year, which is slightly lower than the, the regional average. The second largest route out of Asia or within Asia is China to the United States. Not too surprisingly, that it was the slowest growing route of the, all the major routes in Asia, only 18%. What we're seeing instead is a migration from China US to China Singapore. That route really grew rapidly last year. Also, Singapore to the United States grew uh, rapidly. So if we want to talk about what are going to be the new hubs, in the short term, I think what we're going to see is Singapore. Uh, it's more of the same. It's not a new hub. It's, it's already established as one of the, besides Tokyo, the, one of the two major hubs of, of Asia. Um, it's uh, it's a, perceived as a safer choice by a lot of people. Longer term, there may be issues with Singapore, though, because maybe running out of capacity there or physical space and power in, in Singapore. So the question is where we're going to move to after that. Um, it's un unproven right now how successful the Philippines or Indonesia would be. There are some questions how much cross connects would, would cost in those countries. What is the cabotage situation if to repair interior Tory waters, for example, in Indonesia? So another uh, possible hub that you don't hear of quite a lot is Australia. It, it's not ideal because Australia is physically distant from Southeast and, and Northern Asia and distance does matter uh, because uh, the greater distance, you have greater latency on, on fiber optic cables, but it's a safe choice. We're, I was surprised to learn just last week that there's a mid-major a content provider that recently made the choice to serve its Asian clients from Sydney. And uh, partly because it's, you know, it's a safe regulatory regime. One area that will be interesting to see if it develops is Darwin on the north coast of Australia. Darwin is physically much closer to Southeast Asia, and it also has uh, proximity to cheaper and green solar power from Western Australia. That hasn't really developed yet, but there are some plans afoot to, to explore that. So that might be something something to watch. Okay, terrific. And I realize now we should have had a map up on the screen so that everybody could sort of see uh, see the, the connections. We do have in our brief a couple of maps showing some of what you were talking about, Tim, but that's a very helpful uh, topography, as you said. Um, so thank you for that. So John, let's talk about a bit about the economics of, of this business. And you know, why are subsea cable networks um, such a key ingredient for U.S economic uh, competitiveness and for, you know, for broader, um, broader uh, development of the global economy? That's a good question. Um, as, uh, as we all know, the internet has undoubtedly changed the way global population works today, the way you socialize, share information, uh, you know, as the report you, we've released today, indicates there's over a million kilometers of subsea cables traversing the oceans uh, as we speak. Um, there's a clear connection between the maturity of the internet e ecosystem and rising living standards, which is why the availability of subsea cable systems is so important. Uh, it can be argued from my perspective that the subsea cable landscape is a backbone of technological change globally that's now occurring on, a, on an unprecedented level. Um, I tend to refer to it as uh, a digital infrastructure transformation that we're in right now is the equivalent of the, the fourth industrial revolution, although I'm certainly not the one who has termed or coined that phrase. Um, global communications networks supported by subsea cables are more critical than ever now to delivering breakthroughs in fields like artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, energy exploration of national defense capabilities, and they all come along with cybersecurity challenges. The explosion of uh, 5G networks globally uh, is going to ex exponentially shift towards uh, you know, cloud-based services, which all will surely increase dramatically the amount of data that's being transported. Um, there's clear evidence that in emerging markets, subsea cables and the internet access they deliver is instrumental to 
contributing to vital segments of developing economies. Uh, key sectors can include financial and banking services, healthcare, construction, transportation, obviously education, agriculture, all just to mention a few. Uh, subsea cables are critically important to developing economies as this can be a catalyst for uh, improving in access to the internet for all these services. Uh, they've demonstrated material increases uh, to nations' GDPs. Uh, subsea cable access drives demand for the development of new data centers and ecosystems, uh, including internet exchange points. These data centers help introduce new compelling services for developing markets and economies, and internet exchange points improve the network latency and overall performance. Uh, subsea cables also can drive material percent increase in employment in markets where they land, uh, particularly skill employment, which is uh, of particular interest to um, emerging, emerging economies. Uh, they're also proven to help reduce, in a very simple way, internet prices for consumers and businesses. Uh, these global trends have been really important for Asia markets and countries in Asia Pacific, because uh, and an example of that is manufacturing innovation. Uh, manufacturing innovation in Asia has long been recognized as a major driver of global economic growth in the region, uh, with the rise of manufacturing industries in Asian countries like China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and others. Uh, these markets have become production factories you know, for the world. They do for things like clothing and textiles, machine tools, electronics, computer components. So they are clearly an, impart, an important part of the global value chain, which in my opinion is largely driven by subsea cables and access to the emerging technologies and services. Uh, in short, I see basically the growth of subsea cables in emerging markets uh, as a catalyst for enabling these new applications and services, uh, which drive economic de development and social well-being. Excellent. Okay, couldn't have said it better. That's fantastic. Great way of uh, of laying it out very clearly and and showing what the economic stakes are here. So that's great. Thank you, uh, John. I'm going to come back to you um, with a question in a in a second. But let me bring Catherine into the conversation and ask you about um, the sort of risks and threats to cables because I think there are some misconceptions about this. Um, and uh, you know, so tell us what kind of are the most common risks, um, threats, and, and how does the U.S. government think about those, and what does it do to try to mitigate some of those risks? Got it. Thank you. Um, before I go further, I just need to caveat that all the opinions that I state today are my own and aren't necessarily positions of the, the Navy, the DoD, or any other government agency. Um, so the most common threats, these are everyday threats and resulting faults that occur on a regular routine basis. Um, these are to the physical layer of the cable itself. Um, so the vast majority of this is fishing and anchoring. Um, fishing uh, causes are um, not only the ones that we commonly think of with bottom trawling, but also entanglement from anchors that are used in a variety of fishing methods. Um, especially in Asia, there are a lot of um, fishing aggregating devices that are used and stow nets with very large anchors that can cause tremendous damage. Um, the increased use of data from automated identification systems and vessel monitoring systems um, that are more commonly used uh, on fishing vessels um, is helping cable owners properly attribute the causes of these faults. Um, so they can often identify a vessel in near real time, and sometimes they can even contact a vessel prior to it making contact with a cable to, to even prevent a fault. Um, so they're, they're sorting out um, with quite detail what's fishing and what's anchoring. Uh, there's also a lot of um, faults caused by natural causes. Those have made um, significant uh, um, splashes in the press this year with uh, Tonga and the volcano. Um, so these natural causes can be abrasion from currents um, and submarine landslides. Um, both the man-made and the natural causes uh, have potential to take out more than one cable in a single event. 
Um, there's been anchor drags that have been documented to break multiple cables with a single vessel. Um, and then the sediment flows from um, earthquakes, landslides. Um, these have historically been known to sever multiple ca cables. Um, and they've even, this process has even been used by scientists to measure um, the flow of, of, the, of this uh, over several hours. Um, so in the area of focus here, the Pacific Ring of Fire, of course, you know, it's highly volatile with uh, regular earthquakes and a lot of volcanic action, um, both of which can cause these really, really disastrous sediment flows. Um, a, a, uh, a key characteristic of, of, uh, of a sediment flow from earthquakes generally um, is that you can lose large sections of cable just could be buried and lost. Um, so if, if a cable system is not spared f sufficiently um, with enough cable and even repeaters, um, it, it can be out of service for a very long time from a, from a single incident. Okay, terrific. Well, that's that's really helpful. And again, I before I got into this project, I uh, didn't realize how uh, those sort of natural factors and, and then the, the man-made fishing and anchorage questions were so important, but uh, but really, uh, really uh, helpful. And again, I want to come back to you. But Maureen, let me ask you, um, first of all, can you explain a little bit what this um, new team telecom um, uh, effort is and what what it um, I mean, what what the process is and, and how the government uses that and other uh, means of, of evaluating proposals for new uh, new cable systems and and uh, you know what are the main sort of security and and regulatory and other issues you're looking at as you as you look at these consider these new systems yeah definitely thank you um so when you're looking at the new team telecom you have to remember there was an old team telecom that started around in the late 90s um sort of an ad hoc group of members mostly department of justice department of defense NTIA was part of that as well, as well, you know, of course the FCC, but over time the Department of Homeland Security became a member and Department of State became a member over time as well. Um, but it, I believe that there was a Senate report on Chinese investment in US telecommunication systems that came out in 2020 that called the old team telecom, unfortunately an inextricably black hole for uh, cable review, uh, submarine cable license reviews. Mm -hmm. So with you know, the you know, signing of EO 13913 in April of 2020, you know, there was hope to fix that perception and reality and, and give it more of a structure, this group of structure similar to CFIUS, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States. But, um, somehow strangely different <laughs> and um, where it you know defines the, the policy defines the roles of the committee which is homeland security department of defense and department of justice who is also the chair and then this committee advisor structure which the department of commerce state treasury the u.s office of the u.s trade rep is part of it omb gsa so we bring in all the experts when there is um a specific requirement to. So instead of having the FCC refer the application to this ad hoc group of interagency members, the EO has a formal process. So we, uh, the FCC refers it to Team Telecom or the committee now. Um, I'll save everyone the very long name of the committee, mostly because it's just a tongue twister. But the Committee in Foreign Investment in the United States, or Committee of Foreign Investment and Telecommunications in the United States, I should have that memorized by heart, but I do not. But anyway, Team Telecom, um, that gives them 120 days to do their risk-based assessment, to get a threat assessment from the Intelligence Committee or community, and then to develop um, either standard or sort of a baseline set of mitigation standards, or if there is a national security or law enforcement concern, um, there's an additional 90 days to go through that process again. And then there may be something called a non-standard mitigation agreement. And that's when the committee advisors come into play 
and we offer our interagency expertise on those issues. So that's where we are now. Um, I'll stop there because it could, it's detailed and in the weeds. No, it's, it's very helpful. And, and um, uh, I think we'll stick with Team Telecom um, no, 2.0 no, or something that's, that's less of a, a mouthful. But I do want to come back on that as well. But, but um, uh, actually, can I just, I can't resist asking about the timelines because you said it was um, 120 days. That's four months, right? Plus a possible additional three months. Mm -hmm. I think in our report, we say that the average actual process takes something like eight and a half months, which is a lot longer than than other countries that have similar processes. Is that right? And is that, you know, is that um, a competitive problem for the US if we're, if we're taking that long or is there a legitimate reason we have to spend the extra time? That's a lot longer those timelines also than CFIUS, which has the, the, the committee you mentioned 40, that reviews foreign yeah, investment, uh, which days, is a yeah. much, much quicker turnaround. Well, I think with CFIUS, there was a much more, um, well, they, they had that part of the law uh, earlier than say Team Telecom, and this is still an ex executive order instead of being part of the National Defense Authorization Act, which you know FIRMA um, was part of in 2018. So, I mean, it's a resourcing issue on one hand because of it still being developed and matured. Um, some of the issue is the back and forth and the triage questions between the committee or Team Telecom and the applicants. Some of those required questions have changed even since the EO is signed. Um, the FCC has a process underway right now to formalize a set of standard trias questions. So in hope to streamline that process quite a bit more. And I will tell you as the person who has to prepare every single review for filing with the FCC, no one is sitting on anything. We are trying the committee is trying, NTIA is definitely trying to get all of this done within the fastest amount of time possible. No, you know, no one's playing the game of, oh, we need a, another 90 days to review this, so let's just say we do. No, it's very much a process that DOJ has, you know, made as efficient as they can. I mean, the US government is by far larger than many of the governments that also have similar processes. And we have um, different rules and regulations and the relationship with the intelligence community and what they can and cannot share and um, how that's, you know, that information is then um, informing the committee and et cetera. And then all this has to go into the public record through the FCC.gov website. So it, it's, it's quite different than CFIUS in that you won't see most of those decisions on on a public website where as opposed to with team telecom you do so everyone is definitely dotting i's and crossing t's um i right. will say that it is it is lengthy but it is getting better okay good um well that's helpful and um uh i appreciate that so let me sort of sag from that to a question for tim about sort of um as in other uh endeavors uh, there's a sort of a first line of defense, as it were, from the private sector itself in, in making sure that the operations, the, you know, the, the, the security risks, other uh, challenges around these systems, uh, that they are the first line of defense. And, and it, are, they, are they, is that right in this case? Is the private sector doing kind of the basic work in, um, in um, you know, ensuring the resilience of, of these systems? Um, and then I'm going to maybe ask a follow up, but, but if you can oh, help sure. us. Yeah, absolutely. They're the ones who own the systems and they're financially incentivized to ensure and to try to make them as, re as resilient as possible. They're, that's the, um, private set, the private markets are working in, in that respect. Um, let me take a stab at answering your question just a moment ago of is potential, uh, regulatory risk or delay in, in permitting a possible problem for the United States. And this is not a criticism of Marine or anyone else on Team Telecom. Personally, I'd rather be have my job of just counting the numbers rather than solving all the issues that Marine just laid out. But I would say it is a problem. Um, there are basically two kinds of companies that build cables. One are companies that just need the cable capacity for their own internal needs. 
they don't have to worry about making money off of it. They're not trying to turn a profit. So companies like Google or Meta and so forth, they build the cables and usually in a consortium with other people, other companies, and they use that capacity. They don't try to resell that capacity. But there's another kind of company that also participates in these builds. And these companies do try to make a profit. They will build the cable, put up CapEx and try to sell capacity. Here's where it's an issue for them. Um, they usually need to go to the, to the market to, for debt and equity to raise money because usually they can't finance these cables themselves. It's hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. Financiers are allergic to risk. Makes sense. And the way they can overcome risk is if there's a good chance of a high profit, you're not gonna get huge profits in this industry. It's, it's a pretty tight industry. So risk is a real problem. Um, in addition to presenting numbers and, and doing things like the summary cable map.com, telegeography also advises banks uh, who are looking to invest in the industry. Um, this morning, in preparation for our call, I looked back at a couple of the models we built for them. And the problem in the industry is that prices are going down every year, about depending on the route, 20 to 25%. If you lose a year up front uh, due to permitting problems, if you don't know if it's going to be six months or 18 months to get your permit, if you lose a full year, you've lost 10% of your potential revenue in that system and you're never getting it back. And that may not seem like a lot, but the line between profitability and sort of a go or no go decision on investments is pretty thin. And at least one of those companies, I know that that bank would have said, no, I'm, we're not gonna invest in you if they had had to wait another 12 months to build. So anything that Team Telecom can do, and it sounds like there's a lot of efforts right now uh, to uh, accelerate and, and, and make more um, uh, transparent the permitting issues is, is really going to benefit the industry. Okay, that's helpful. You know, John, let me bring you in on this if I can. I was gonna ask you and sort of shift gears a little bit and ask sort of what's in it for the, uh, for the other countries involved, the developing countries in Asia and so forth, and how this uh, stimulates our growth. And you're welcome to answer that question. But I'm also interested in your sort of take on this conversation about, about the, the process of, of approving these um, systems and, and whether there's room for improvement, whether the private sector is doing um, you know, enough to kind of ensure that the systems are resilient so that maybe that could contribute to a speeding up of, of the process. But um, any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I have a couple thoughts. I, I think, first of all, right now, I think the U.S. has largely taken what I would call a defensive approach, you know, to protecting its interests by prohibiting landing of subsea cables by uh, on U.S. coastlines by untrusted party ownership interests. Um, that focus only addresses, though, a single geographical segment of what is a global challenge. In reality, many of the world's largest subsea cable and internet hubs, they're neutral and open points of presence that are located outside of the U.S. Um, where subsea cables can interconnect with one another and still reach U.S. coastlines via systems that already exist. So the challenge of this is you know, that, that Team Telecom has is they really only have authority over the U.S. coastlines when, in fact, the global infrastructure is interconnected at hubs that are not even located in the U.S. So this is not simply a matter, in my opinion, of protecting direct landing on U.S. coastlines um, as the U.S. coastlines can realistically be accessed via interconnection of subsea cable systems and territories outside of the U.S. So that is, is what I see as a broader challenge. I think the cooperation between um, private sector and government agencies really needs to move to another level. Um, just as the digital infrastructure has exploded globally to a new level. Although important work today is being carried out in examining the foundation that subsea cables and technologies are playing in economic growth and national security, I think 
it's important for the US to think globally in conjunction with trusted allies and partners, and then have government agencies and private sectors working proactively together in an effort to cooperate in advance, you know, what are essentially mutually beneficial goals and objectives. Um, my sense is, is that that's a big challenge because they've historically had adversarial roles. <laughs> I mean, the, the private sector pushes for things. They see Team Telecom as an adversary trying to inhibit their, their commercial progress. Uh, but I think all of us sort of need to put that behind us. Um, in my opinion, there needs to be a new balance of cooperation achieved between the government and private sector. And the key word here is cooperation. And that cooperation has to take on new and profound changes. Uh, an example of this, not to get long-winded, but you know, private sector has unleashed a flood of information and related capabilities uh, in the digital revolution. And the US government is no longer in sole possession of the lead in complex technology. The most powerful computing in the USA could arguably be said that it's done by the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons and Microsofts of the world, not the Pentagon and the NSA. Um, these private sector enterprises are also the global leaders in deploying the actual subsea cable systems, enabling advancements, uh, and they also possess many more times of information you know, about individuals and commercial activities than most governments can ever obtain. So the, the landscape between, you know, the government and the private sector has radically changed. As it relates to untrusted parties, you know, China has a has great advantage in this in this situation. China, is, you know, has control over virtually all intellectual property and information, you know, which resides in the central government. Uh, it no longer simply represents a political or military threat, but it's a combined technology and economic threat. Um, they're clearly advancing, you know, their strategic goals, you know, in a unified effort between government and business sectors. And the USA's goals seem to be the responsibility of the US government alone. So the playing field isn't level. I'm, I'm an advocate, and, and I think I talked to you, Matt, about it, that says we take Team Cal Telecom a step further. The review process is good, but it's taking things, it's taking time, and it's taking a limited point of view. I think we can establish and, and strengthen global, you know, digital infrastructure for U.S. interests by establishing a coordination group that includes both U.S. government and private sector stakeholders. Uh, those parties, you know, would not just look at subsea cables, but they could look at subsea cables, data centers, cable landing stations, terrestrial networks they interconnect with globally, other strategic hubs, take a holistic approach and view to what types of standards and things can be developed and, and conveyed that are in the mutual best interests of all parties. I think that group can then take a step further and launch what I would call diplomatic engagements with key regions and countries to educate and inform them as well as to collect valuable market intelligence. You know, this type of U.S. engagement and outreach can help educate foreign governments. Uh, it can advance the interests of, you know, strategically valuable vendors, suppliers. It can also include uh, financial investment partners, uh, but essentially, you know, doesn't look at this as simply a U.S. centric challenge because the, the, the evolution of the marketplace is going beyond that. OK, really, really helpful. And you've touched on a lot of things that I wanted to ask about. Let me um, let me ask um, Maureen, maybe. And Catherine, you're also welcome to to comment on, on this on, on a couple of the dimensions there. I mean, first of all, 
uh, your name was invoked. So in presidential debate terms, you're entitled to a rebuttal. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but but seriously, um, I mean, more kind of I don't, you know, want to encourage you to be defensive about Team Telecom. I just oh. do, but but I'm more in a positive way, sort of what about some of the ideas for working more closely between private and public sector, you know, working with allies? Um, you know, do you think some of that is 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 a constructive set of things to look at uh, that would make the process better? No, thank you. And, and thank you, John, for those. Um my thoughtful uh, ideas and, and policy suggestions. I think Team Telecom suffers from uh, it being connected to a licensing process. So there are very clear rules and, and regulations that you know the FCC has to follow, that the interagency has to follow in order to make sure that the licensing process happens in a very neutral and fair way. I am not a telecom lawyer. I, I am sort of the odd one out here at NTIA with that regard, but as a, you know, a seasoned national security expert, it is, those types of frameworks have, have created their, their own challenges. And I'm not sure it, it would, it would take a lot to innovate through that. However, there is a lot going on outside of the pure FCC license review process that speaks to what John was, was suggesting. Um, for example, NTIA works with the State Department on um, advocating for a supplier diversity, especially within 5G and the Internet of Things, looking for trusted vendors and working on interoperability and securing networks that way. I know the, the State Department is part of the cable license process by law and, and history too. So, you know, they're always making sure to reach back to your know, embassies and consulates um, through that process as well. And they have their own relationship with Team Telecom and with the FCC. So there is a lot of back and forth going on um, within the public private partnerships of it all. You know, we have the FASC through the Department of Defense and, and the rest of the US government on acquisitions and cybersecurity issues and supply chain issues. We have EO 13873, which is the information and communication technology services um, security review process that is hosted within the Department of Commerce too. So, I mean, I feel like perhaps adding another layer may not smooth the seams or the rough edges it may just make it heavier and it would be help more helpful if we could bring everything together and sort of figure out this group is doing this we're doing this this is happening over here and let's all share information to you know as we can as in good stewards of taxpayer dollars and as um good citizens um on the internet however we all know that's easier said than done um, but I will say that between, you know, NTIA has its own authorities on reaching out to the private sector. Um, you know, we're not a regulator, we're not an authorizer, right? So we can have a neutral conversation and bring those topics to the team telecom room. We can take it to the um, domestic broadband infrastructure development areas. We can, we can help align as much as we can. Uh, because we are sometimes this neutral uh, party with, you know, 50, you know, 40 years of historical experience in telecommunications. Okay, that's really helpful, and I appreciate your kind of your your frank answer there. And and um, I, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask I'm gonna preview a question for a pair of questions for Catherine, but I want to actually still ask you another question, Maureen. Um, Catherine, uh, just to pull in the international dimensions of this. For, first of all, a simple question, which actually a, a viewer has has asked, but I had the same question is what are um, sort of the international legal protections for subsea cables and, and how well do those work? And then the, the second part for you, Catherine, is, um, is is somebody else alluded to working with several people to um, working with allies and partners. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what we are doing, what we could do um, more in that regard? But before you answer that, I want to ask Maureen, and then you can comment on this too, Catherine, about China's growth as, a, as an owner and, and, and provider of of subsea cable systems. 
you know, how has that uh, changed the uh, the process um, from your perspective, uh, Maureen? Is that, I mean, it's been alluded to, but I want to take it on head on. You know, how has that sort of complicated issues? There we go. So, so yeah, I think that is the complicating factor. And it's not just China, it's Hong Kong, it's sometimes Taiwan. Um, it depends on if you're talking about data transfer, uh, if you're talking about locations of data centers, which by the way, the FCC does not regulate or license data centers. Um, that's an interesting gap. If you're talking about commercial bulk data sales, which again, no one really regulates that quite well. So it is like we have to identify the real risks within at least the team telecom process of, of sort of tertiary connections. And like John said, um, and other speakers said before, the, inter the internet is everywhere. You can't just say data is only going point A to point B. There are so many hubs and, and connections in between. So it, it, it complicates it. And so when you talk about the length of the team telecom process, you really are talking about with with regard to submarine cables, where is the cable landing station located? Um, if you wanna look at one that has taken a long time, um, you know, it's it's one, it was private owned cable and it had a connection to Hong Kong and it had a majority ownership stake with a Hong Kong company. That took a long time for Team Telecom to review and you know, make the recommendation to the FCC. Now, if you look at another cable that connects to France, it took from filing the application to granting the application took four months. So, I mean, the, the China factor adds time because of the National Security Review, more not times than not, if there's a Chinese company involved or the owner is located, the ownership of something um, is located in Hong Kong, then it becomes this lengthier review. However, the FCC has given us some helpful guidance in their list of companies that are no longer allowed to connect to the US telecommunications section or market, um, the China telecoms, the China mobiles of the world. So some of that is simply some applications were stagnant for a while. The EO came into play and then some of the decisions like Hong Kong Americas and PLCN happened. And so people were reevaluating who's part of their consortium. And so I think we're still gonna see that going forward. Um, consortiums who may have included a, you know, a, a company that's now been banned by the FCC, um, having to look at it again and withdraw their application and reassess and, and then try to apply again in the future, which, which was said isn't helpful for the moving the fast pace of business but it's just how the you know we are prioritizing the national security side of it got it okay really helpful catherine do you want to weigh in on that or any of that or you know just um, go back to the questions i asked about international law and then sort of working with allies and partners in this space yeah absolutely um first to touch on a couple of things that uh, that maureen was talking about um and the questions from john uh, I mean, there are several organizations within government that um, already are in a position to work with industry um, in, in reviewing and assessing uh, both the, um, the threats and how, how to best deal with it. So something, some, some of the organizations are within DHS or, you know, like uh, the, the telecommunications advisory councils. But they're not focused particularly on submarine cables. They have much broader tasking. So one of the things that could be done was it would be to, to you know, for a while at least, focus these organizations specifically on submarine cables. And it would it would require them to you know look less at some of the greater cyber nature and more specifically at the at the parts of physical you know cable issues that we're talking about. Um, so back to uh, the legal protections, um, the primary, there's, 
there's not a lot of depth in international law uh, about cables. There are two primary um, uh, documents. One is from 1884. It's Convention on the Protection of the Submarine Telegraph Cables, and that requires state parties, of which the U.S. is one, um, to establish offenses for cable damage. So, you know, 100 and what is it, almost 120 years ago, the nation said, it's bad to damage cables. Countries, you need to enact legislation to, um, to keep your individuals, your, your ships and your people from damaging cables. Um, and so that's still in place. The, the next one really is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which codifies a right to lay cables as one of the freedoms of the seas, like, you know, like navigation of overflight. Um, cables um, are at the same level of importance um, as those kind of fundamental uses of the ocean. And it provides, again, that every state shall adopt laws and regulations establishing um, a punishable offense under national law for breaking or injury by either a ship under their flag or a person subject to their jurisdiction um, through either willful or capable negligence. So it doesn't even have to be... Um, willful damage, but if you if you aren't taking proper care and you damage it through your activities. Um, so so a, um, an example of that could be something like um, deep sea mining. When, if a company gets a lease from the International Seabed Authority to, uh, to mine resources in a particular area in the deep ocean, and they don't take uh, proper precautions for a cable that may have been installed through that area prior to the lease. Um, that in theory, or that, you know, under the law should be a punishable offense. Um, so, so with all of these, there's no, for, there's no real international protection. It's, a, it's an international obligation of countries to hold their own people accountable. But 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 the, but but uh, you didn't say this, but we often do at CSAS um, tilting at windmills uh, that the United States should uh, ratify the UN uh, law of the sea. That would be helpful um, uh, in this regard. I mean, and um, so we recommended that in our brief, and I assume you would agree in principle that that would be a good thing, even if you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> I, I certainly do. Personally, I think it would be great. Um, but uh, the United States does treat it as customary international law, whether or not we are um, a, uh, a ratified party to that. Got it. Um, OK, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, we've got some interesting questions coming in and still might be able to get to one or two more. But let me ask a kind of out of uh, left field or out of outer space, a question which I think is interesting uh, from a viewer, uh, Stephen Benson, asks, how will the coming space infrastructure growth change the undersea um, hub lay down? I don't know who's best to answer that, but that's an interesting question. We're doing other work on sort of space-based um, uh, telecommunication systems, um, about to do a new project on low Earth orbit um, systems. And uh, so interesting in that, in that, does that affect this story at all? I don't know, Tim, or I don't know who yeah, would be. I, I can take a crack at that. Yeah. I, my guess is that it's gonna affect the, the way the architecture looks overall, not very much. The, there are two very different use cases for satellite and summary cables. Summary cables for trunk hauling, the, the big backbones. It's way more cost efficient to do that over fiber optic cables than over satellites. And even with the new technologies uh, going up, the new satellite constellations, that won't change. Yeah, and the cost I, per I, bit is way higher. I would just add to that, um, you know, clearly that the latency and network performance, you know, on a, on a submarine fiber optic cable is going to be less than naturally, you know, satellite-based services. Satellite-based services that will, you know, offer solutions to rural and remote areas, particularly uh, in emerging markets where terrestrial infrastructure doesn't exist to provide the levels of connectivity to those areas uh, from the cable heads. So they can actually complement each other, particularly in, in developing economies where, again, national infrastructure uh, is weaker. 
but we're still going to be laying down cables yeah. under yeah. underwater and yeah, uh, for the, decade, years to come. The, the pile on just real quickly, just you know, NTIA is is working on, of course, our our goal to connect every American to affordable broadband under the Infrastructure Jobs Act, and 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 it is challenging when you talk about satellite because whether it's the IIJA Act or other processes through the U.S. government, there is a significant supply chain concern when it comes to satellites. What's made in America, very little. What's manufactured in America, assembled in America, a little bit more. But um, you know, there's still many issues there when it comes to uh, satellite. Thank you. Okay, excellent. I don't know, unless Catherine, you had something to add to that. I um, I got we're getting a sort of pair of questions about sort of the more pure security questions here. Um, uh, as a national security think tank, I think I should take this pair of questions, um, which is, um, uh, you know, it seemed one person asked Joseph Williams, um, seems like subsea cables are extremely vulnerable to UAV unarmed vehicle attacks. Wouldn't it be fairly easy to isolate a country like Taiwan or Japan in a time of adversarial activities? And there's another sort of similar question about what would be the impact of disabling major subsea cables during a war? Uh, for the United States, how would it affect our strategic capabilities in the Pacific theater? Um, and how would it affect global communications, international trade? That was Sophie Lynn Weiss, who's asking that question. So I don't know who is best positioned, maybe Catherine, <laughs> um, to, to try to take on some of that. Well, I think, I think isolating a country that has taken proper precautions with redundancy, um, is quite difficult. Um, in the example of Japan, there are many cables that connect to it, um, and so it would it would be a significant effort to um, to disconnect it completely. Um, and as long as as long as um, you know there's still connectivity, then then um, I think the the owners of the cables um, are are quite um, they are prepared you know through interconnectivity and meshing between networks to to make do if they lose um, a, a cable or two and so um, I think it, I think it would be a difficult situation to get into okay uh, did, unless anybody wants to add to that um someone uh, oh Matt Whalen my um, my research assistant is pointing out that uh, that there has not been a deliberate attack by one state on another's cable since World War One, so it is. It may be theoretically possible, but it seems as though it doesn't happen very often. It doesn't mean no, it could and, and I think you know that I would just add that you know the companies that are either customers of cable systems, owners, or investors or users, they have network planners that plan, as Catherine mentioned, for diverse routes, backup routes, alternate routing. Um, you know. This is very important to them, particularly in 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 you know today's e-commerce world, cloud services world. You know, downtime would be a significant negative impact on parties. So they put a lot of effort and investment in in building resilient networks that can allow for rerouting of traffic in the case of either an attack or a, a, a fishing vessel, you know, who who drops anchor on a cable. So. Uh, you know, I think it's of, of concern, but they, I know they certainly plan for it. Okay, uh, we're just about out of time. We got one minute left and I wanted to give any of the speakers a chance if there's anything else we didn't cover that you'd like to say, maybe in sort of reverse order of what, of, of when I originally called on you, which I think was Maureen, Catherine, John, Tim. Maureen, anything additional you wanna add in 30 seconds? Okay, trying to get I got it, it finally. Okay. No, what I will say is that, you know, we to review for security and cybersecurity issues, it's always adds this complicating factor, right? And the US government owes it to our taxpayers that we try to protect our network network as much as possible, but we walk a fine line of possibly stymieing, you know, innovation and and perhaps, you know. Mm -hmm slowing down our growth, you know, our leadership in, in the internet um, as a, you know, as a innovator and a security provider for other countries too. So I think just to say that 
you know, it is important to secure, it is important to innovate, but like John mentioned before, we do need to talk more with our private sector colleagues and we do need to make sure that we have the flexibility built in to make sure America, United States is the leader in the internet um, and we can be seen by our partners as, as someone to trust when it comes to that without removing freedom of speech and, and civil liberties at the same time. Thank you. Great, Great. well said, thanks Maureen. Catherine? Yeah, I'd like to um, just sum up with a mention that of the International Cable Protection Committee and their best practices for government, um, the, the ICPC has put together a, a list of things that if properly um, adopted by governments can um, greatly um, make them uh, immune to you know, these massive cutoffs or and, and foster the industry. Um, it, they can focus on things that are statistically significant, which is the average everyday um, damage to cables. And by doing that, they can make their, their, um, their networks uh, as a whole more resilient and more redundant. Okay, helpful, thanks, John. I'm good. <laughs> You're good. Thank All you. Right. Thank, thank you. Um, really appreciate your, your earlier contributions. Tim? Well, Catherine stole my comment. So thanks very much there, Catherine. Um, I don't know if you're speaking for the United States Navy or for yourself there, but you, you didn't do me any favors. Um, I, I would um, I would recommend that the participants in the webinar, the, the viewers of the webinar, if you haven't already, go read this brief uh, that the CIS, CSI has put out. It's a lot more nuanced than a lot of the ones I've seen that talk about public-private partnership uh, to protect submarine cables. In particular, two points really jumped out at me. One was the point that Catherine made, uh, that CSIS also recommends that the US government um, helps encourage other countries to ad adopt a lot of the ICPC best practices. And lastly, the point about increasing transparency and predictability of US policy uh, on US on, on submarine cables would be really well received by the industry. Okay, uh, thanks, Tim, for the uh, for the uh, advertising. The check, check free, in the, the absolutely check, free. The check is in the mail. Um, seriously, um, thank you all. I I should say, although this is public and on the record, um, Catherine said it. Maureen didn't, but I'll just on their behalf say, you know, they were here as individuals and uh, giving their own views and not representing their the U.S. government or their agencies. So I appreciate their willingness to speak as frankly as they did. I appreciate your service as well, both of you. Um, and Tim and John as well, thank you uh, for your contributions again to this whole project, to the brief, uh, to this conversation. You guys have been all just terrific. So if I could uh, encourage our audience to applaud, I would. Uh, thank you all. And, um, and do look at our brief, which is on the CSIS website. And uh, you know this conversation is to be continued and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at CSIS soon. But thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.